well, <laughs> strict travel restrictions and then yellow means you can go but you have to uh, make sure that you're negative and you're tested like right before you go on the airplane and things like that okay um i need to go on friesian horse association and then is there i can't find the link up there last time i had it running next to the computer so i could see how the videos were doing and what i had to do again it's Frisian horse association of north america right fha fha and a i'm gonna do okay so what's going on here i'm trying to get this oh Ah, there it is. Okay, I'm going to go live on Facebook. I'm going to see if I can find the link. Because I have the. Oh, there it is. Yes, I'm going to put it on. Something. I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. Oh, why is that happening? This webinar is being recorded. Continue. I have to go agree with that. Okay, that's what I did right now. Start webinar. There we go. Okay. Well, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this evening, Preparing Your Frisian for the Inspection, Part 4, Planning for the Big Day, presented by Petra Zeeland and Duca Hoekstra. This webinar is being brought to you by the Finway Foundation for Frisian Horses. We also want to recognize Lisa Baker and the Education Committee for coordinating this webinar. We are recording the webinar and plan to have it posted in our library in the next few days. It should also be noted that we are broadcasting live on Facebook. As we have said before, you may experience some latency issues with the broadcast. Unfortunately, this is not something we as the host can fix. This is due to each viewer's network configuration. We would suggest, suggest that if you are experiencing issues with latency, that you conduct a speed test or a latency test for future broadcasts. Tonight, everyone will be in listen-only mode. We will stop periodically throughout the presentation to ask questions. To submit your questions, you can use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen toolbar. If you are on Facebook, Please write your questions in the comments and we will try to get it answered for you. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Petra Zeeland. Petra? Yes, hi. Thank you. Um, Second you want, here. You want me to go to share screen? Yes. Okay. Share screen. And I think I have to. I'm trying to. Oh, ha, huh. didn't see the right button. There we go. Yes. There we go. So, um, tonight. I wanted to talk about preparations for the big day. Um, 
in my own planning, I had prepared to uh, show uh, some other things, but we had a month of rain here. So uh, we couldn't video or take any pictures that are used that I wanted to use for this because I just told Jason we were ankle deep in rain and mud and that wouldn't be a nice picture. So I swapped them around. Preparation for the big day. This is in particularly important for, um, I think, the not so experienced uh, Frisian owners or the new Frisian owners uh, that we have uh, now and that weren't able to go to occurring last year. Uh, we just hope that in September um, we're able to do all that again. So in preparation for that, um, I made this uh, webinar. Um, here we go. Um, today, more practical things and a bit less horses. Um, make lists. Important is that you make lists for the day of the curing. Going to an event that only takes place once a year can be unnerving and can make you forget things. I know that for over 25 years, when you get nervous, you're forgetting things. I can tell you that I had a selection for national dressage selection. Uh, I showed up a day early. I was that nervous. Um, I've seen people come late to the curing in North America. I can tell you that it doesn't help with the stress. So when you sign up for the curing, know that it is multiple days sometimes. Um, make sure that you contact the organization and um, ask them on what day you can um, enter, but also on what day uh, you can go with your horse to the stables um, or the, the, the um, I forgot the English word, the yeah, location, the location it's held at, because you probably rent stables and you want to be there a day early to give your horse uh, the proper rest. So it's important to know um, what day you're able to uh, go and enter yourself uh, to those stables. Um, for traveling. Now for us, it's different in the Netherlands. Uh, I know for in the US, you have to do a lot of paperwork sometimes. Um, paperwork curing, um, that means that have um, ask your um, local organization that does the curing um, for what paperwork you need to bring of your foal or the mare or the stallion um, that they want to see or that you have to uh, give to the judges or have to give to the person to the fauna that um, will send it to the Netherlands or um, makes the paper or renews the paper if your horse gets a different uh, uh, get star for instance goes from stud book to star you have to give uh, your paper to the fauna and they will uh, change your uh, degree on the horse. Um, paperwork fauna. Um, vaccination paperwork is very important. Um, I know for some states vaccination is different than for other states. So if you cross the border, make sure that you know um, what vaccinations your horse need to have and what time it need to have, have those vaccinations before they go to that event. Um, I know for some states, between some states, you need travel documentations from a state vet as well. Uh, make sure that you have those papers in order too. It doesn't mean that people will look at it, but sometimes when you go to a big event, so if, if, if a freezing curring is just a part of a big event, um, they want to see uh, more paperwork or different paperwork than uh, the smaller currings at smaller uh, locations. So make sure that you uh, know those that information before you go to a curring because you would be very upset and sad if you go to that 
location and you're not allowed to unload your horse because your paperwork isn't in order. So make sure that all that stuff is in order or ask somebody who has a lot of experience in this or ask uh, uh, someone at FANA or at your local um, uh, Frisian club. And there's always somebody that can help you with that. So that's very important for the new Frisian owners or the new curing um, goers that uh, paperwork is very important. Now, if you've done your paperwork, you entered your horse, um, you talked to the fauna, you had your vaccinations, travel documentations and everything, your transport needs to be in order. So arrange your transport on time, get your horse or horses to the curing site. So for people who have their own, and this is just um, things that I think are very important, that if you have your own transport, have your trailer mechanically in order for transport. Uh, going to a curing is usually a longer drive, a longer ride than you probably would normally do. Sometimes you do it even in two days or it, it takes sometimes at least eight hours. Um, make sure that everything is in order, that your car is in order, that it's me mechanically all correct. Um, uh, give your car and trailer a good clean. It always looks very nice when you come up with a clean car and trailer, of course. Uh, know how to hook up. I've seen, for us, the hook on, hooking up of the trailers is very different than for you guys. I had to learn to hook up trailers in um, Northern America as well. It works with chains and they have to be hooked up in a certain way because it doesn't uh, turn or break or work in the right way. So, um, and I know that some people come to currents and don't know how to hook up or unhook their own trailer. So make sure that you um, get some information on that as well. Plan your route wise. Um, years ago, we, it's 24 years ago now, we traveled from California to Kentucky actually for uh, the, um, what is that big event once every two years. Um, the Equitana. I don't know if it still is in Kentucky, but we had the Equitana 24 years ago. We traveled from California to Kentucky and we had two big trucks, one big rental truck and one of the owner of the stable himself. Now, going up into the mountains, we found out the tractor of the trailer of the big um, uh, 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 trailer didn't, wasn't able to pull the trailer of the big truck. So the engine wasn't strong enough when we went into the mountains. I can tell you that was very, very scary. So that's always something I keep remembering that when you go to occurring, I always wonder, are we going through the mountains? Because I really want to make sure that we don't go down a mountain and the uh, truck doesn't have the right brakes. I mean, it was a really, really big truck. It was holding, it had place for, I think 12 horses, nine at least, and then uh, a carriage as well. So it was a big truck, but it was very scary. And we found out at night because our drivers uh, swapped and then suddenly they said, you have to wake up, you have to wake up. And then they told us that we were going a little bit too fast and the brakes weren't holding. So something to remind yourself that you make sure that when you go through the mountains, your car and your trailer can handle it engine wise. And the weather, of course, when you go in the winter, you have very um, cold weather and snow and all that stuff. Make sure that you maybe uh, go sooner so that you have a a uh, time-wise enough time to uh, go where you need to go. So that's very important. Petra, it should also be noted maybe to uh, check the tires on your trailer as well. Yes. Make sure that those are in, in good shape and good working order as well. So 
Yes. Uh, Annette Carpenter brought that brought that uh, question to me. Yes. Check the whole. Just make sure that everything is in order. For for us, it's um, different um, because we have so many shows within. 20 minutes sometimes within an hour we can choose from 50 shows if we don't have COVID and um, we don't have to make those long hauls we're ending up in different countries when we do those long hauls so this is what I can remember of what we were doing when I was in the in the US so um, that's how I came up with this list um, when you're not able to drive your horse or when you think it's too stressful, you can always uh, rent a driver or transport with a big truck or something and find out if, um, of course, um, it's a known one and well-recommended company. Um, I think you can work with insurance, travel insurance and all that stuff. I don't know exactly how that works um, over in Northern America, but um, that is an uh, a possibility too. I know that um, for instance, uh, last year or the year, no, the year before, of course, uh, with Friesian Connection, uh, we, they rented the whole truck for all the horses to haul and we just brought all the tech and stuff in the trailer. Uh, a little bit later. So that was easy for us as well that time. I'd like to, to add something to that though. If, if a member does have to uh, uh, go through a truck and, and rental of a truck that um, we're not uh, recommending anybody specifically, but Bob Hubbard is a sponsor of Faunas and they will give you a discount uh, for your horses. So you just need to contact them, let them know that you're a member of Fauna and uh, they will help you out uh, with discounts and, and so oh, forth. Oh, perfect, perfect. Um, so, it, well, like I said, it helps when you know people and when they're well recommended and this helps too when you get a discount. So thank you. Um, then for the next one, I just wanna show a little bit of difference between the way we go to a show or occurring so on the left side, you see some brown horses, but this is how we go to our dressage shows. You can see almost everybody has a two horse trailer and with kind of a normal car in front of them. We don't have the big cars you have while well, they're coming more and more. Um, the right pictures on the right side are all the trailers for the curring. When we go to a curring, the horses stay on the trucks or stay in the trailers and we take them out and uh, when you see uh, the picture in the middle, the picture is taken off the roof, probably of a uh, commentary station, and right behind the commentary station are all these cars and trucks. So it's all very close together. And even what we do sometimes, I go there in the morning, watch some horses, and I have horses in the afternoon. I go back up, back home, pick up the horses, and uh, go back to the curring again or the other way around. Um, but if your horse is very early in the morning and they do well, they go back on the trailer, you give them some food, some water, and they have to stay there sometimes from 10 till four in the afternoon uh, because they have to go up for a championship or something. For us, this is quite normal. Um, there are now rules in the Netherlands that if it becomes above a certain temperature, then um, they cancel the event um, because of animal cruelty laws that are up now, because sometimes our temperatures can go so high up that horses, um, it's harder for horses to present themselves and it's not very animal friendly. So um, there are some rules. We had some currings be canceled on the morning of the event because they were kind of already um, feeling the temperature was going to be hot. So they give everybody the message that it's canceled. And it's sad, but that happens sometimes. Um, and they will solve it in a different way, maybe a day later. Or what they do is they sh uh, change the schedule 
and you end up going at seven o'clock instead of nine o'clock. We start two hours early, but we have that possibility because we all live so close. We get a message in the evening. Okay, guys, it's going to be too hot. We have to go a lot, start a lot earlier. So this is a big difference between um, the way of traveling between the, the Northern America and the Netherlands. Okay, the next location. Um, I always like when I'm uh, at occurring in uh, Northern America is to get to know the location where I'm going to. Um, you go through your um, Frisian club to reserve your stables and you let them know if you're coming with a stallion or a mare or a mare and a baby and how many, of course. Um, find out if they have night watchers, what the rules are and uh, at that particular location. Sometimes you can work out something with feeding the horses or um, when you put something in front of the stall and you ask night watchers to uh, feed the horses, they will do that for you or um, uh, fellow uh, Frisian owners. You know, if you go for a couple of days, you can ask them, okay, if I feed tomorrow morning, can you feed uh, the day after very early or at night? Uh, things like that. Talk to each other and uh, figure those things out. And um, sometimes it's nice to sleep in a little bit and have your horse fed on a very early uh, time. Um, there are usually ground maps of the facilities. Uh, that show you where the stables are, um, that there is a, a warm-up arena, there's a big show arena, um, and um, you can put up, uh, usually they're numbered, and you can sign in for, I need so many stalls, and I need one or two extra, one for a tag room, one for a feed room, and all that stuff. Um, I always like to know where I'm going and have a map of the town we stay in as well, where the hotel is. If you have a multiple day occurring, um, what the route is towards the, um, the horse event um, property and um, that where the restaurants are, of course, where you want to go to eat and all that stuff. I always like to know where that is and um, that if people um, call you that you have to come quickly because there's something with your horse that you know where you have, how you have to drive and get there as soon as possible. Um, that's also something when you have your horses in the stable there, make sure that your uh, phone number is on the stable door of your horse that people can call you in case of emergency. Now, when you have that all, I just went a little bit fast. When you have that all ready um, and figured out, then you can start preparing to get your horse ready and your horse and trailer ready. I made a list of things that you need to go to the curing in Northern America. It's a, almost always a multiple day event. You almost always stay over for at least one night. So go over this real quick. This is what I talked about. This is my overall list. So location, uh, travel, paperwork. Now for showing, you need your bridles, your chains, your whip. This is all you need when you go as a, a first time Frisian curring uh, participant. Uh, you need to bring the show bridles, four in hand, the chain, the whip, uh, shaker box or bottle, um, a saddle if you're doing an IBOP, a carriage if you're doing a, a, a driven, uh, IBOP, riding bridle, saddle pad. This is just the standard list that you bring when you are participating in all the white clothes. Now, in the beginning, I thought it was very um, funny to see everybody in white clothes on occurring um, in Northern America, but 
I later understood why that was, and I completely understand because at occurring, there are usually two or three runners. Now, if you have a group of five or six or seven horses that all have to come back into the arena, it just looks really nice when or if a owner walks with his own horse in the arena just for the walk or for the presentation um, for the end presentation or a championship just in the walk that they wear white clothes it just looks so much better um, so that's something you don't want to forget bring some white clothes just in case you have to walk with your own horse because there are just two or three runners at your location they can't walk with all the horses um, so that's important not to forget. The grooming kit, uh, you need to bring extra stuff just in case your horse is not clean anymore uh, when you arrive. Um, then at the location, it's very important, ask if there is a possibility to wash your horse. Um, of course, you wash them at home before you leave. And, but I know that in a lot of locations, you can wash your horse uh, a day before you uh, go to the curing because the horse probably got dirty or sweaty uh, while traveling. They got dirty feet because they stood in their own poop for a couple of hours. They peed on their tail and things like that. So it's always nice to know if you can wash them there and that you bring the stuff that you need to wash your horse. Now for the presentation, just before you bring them to the arena, we have the baby oil, a dark washcloth, and particularly a dark washcloth because sometimes I made the mistake to use a white one, an older one, <laughs> and that was a little bit flaky. And suddenly, my Frisian that I in two minutes had to go into the arena had all white spots all over the body. So I had to do the whole horse again because I had to take all the white little flakes of cotton off the horse so that was horrific so make sure it's a dark washcloth or a dark rag uh, to do that um, a sheepskin glove is always nice to use as a last wipe over just before they go into the arena um, hoof black and at home or in the stable i always use the nice uh, nail polish hoof black that's really shiny but just in case when you're on your way to the arena or they just step on their hooves, I always uh, have a, 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 a spray paint can with me black and that is a quick dry so that you can touch up real quickly because everybody knows what can happen if you have that hoof black nail polish and the horse moves and accidentally kicks it and it ends up in your face and you enter the arena with all black spots because you can't get it off your face. <laughs> and you look like a leopard when you enter and the hoof of your horse is not black. So I wouldn't bring that to the arena, bring the black spray can just to do the touch-ups. Um, the mane and tail brush, I always like to have one in my um, back pocket, uh, rubber bands for after, electrical tape, as you guys use a lot of the times, uh, just to bind the, the mane together if they have a really long mane. Uh, scissors, you always lose your scissors. You always have to ask your neighbors if you can use the scissors to cut the little ropes or the tie rips of the numbers on the bridle. So don't forget them. Uh, clippers, I always bring the, the wireless clippers just in case I see something I'm not satisfied, satisfied about and I want to do a touch-up or somebody else asks me to help them out with some touch-up of the clippers. Now, about that, um, there are some rule changes about that. So I know for the FAE and uh, it's I don't know if there are any currings on locations that are uh, that do have FAE events going on when the curring is there. Okay, good to know because the FAE has a rule that you're not allowed to clip any horses on the location that the FAE 
has an event on. So if you want to clip, even if you want to go to the SHAR show or whatever, officially worldwide, you're not allowed to use clippers, electrical clippers on the property of where the FE has shows at the time they organize them. So within those dates, it's just something that is since 2019. Um, I didn't know that either, but I heard it somewhere and I just wanted to look it up. And sometimes you have combined shows and um, when they find out you're doing that, you get expelled or I don't know exactly what the consequences are, but that's something to save in your back head, in, in the back of your head uh, for in the future maybe. Um, then for the stables, water buckets, food throughs. Petra, I just interrupt you real quick before you move yes. on to, to the stables. I've got a question here about the uh, spray paints and what yes. kind of spray you are using if there's a certain brand that you recommend. Uh, no, I just take the cheapest one that's a quick dry. Just, just, just a quick dry is what you recommend? Yes, always quick dry because if you have something that's not a quick dry, it can take up to an hour. Perfect. And Thank quick, you. quick dry is you put them in cross ties and it's uh, done within 10 minutes usually. But I use them as um, backup. Um, as you saw in the picture, we do a lot of curings in the grass. And if you're at the curring and we tie them behind the trailer and um, we have to use the hoof black, then we have a problem because the grass and the horses won't stand still. So I do the touch-ups at the curing with a, with a spray paint. We don't have the luxury to put them in cross ties in a clean stable and paint the hoofs. We have to do that the night before at home. So that's Thank you. why um, we use that. Um, okay. So water buckets, food troughs, pliers, pinchers, that's just uh, when you wanna hang up stuff and you, want, you need to cut something or um, stable banners, um, cross ties, bedding enough, you're always short. That's experience. Um, <laughs> water hoses, uh, sometimes you have wash racks, but they don't have water hoses at the locations. Make sure that you know that before you go there. Um, Clean trailer and car, of course, shovel, pooper scooper. I call them pooper scoopers. It's just a, everybody knows what I mean when I say pooper scooper. So a broom, a mug bucket, a wheelbarrow, uh, extra halters and a lead rope. Depending on how many horses you bring, you, don't, you do or don't need a wheelbarrow, of course. Extra halters and lead ropes, um, I think you have to bring them. Um, it's a new, exciting, tense location where you're going to a horse can always break a halter or uh, cut a uh, or pull off a, a halter rope or lead rope so make sure that you bring some extra for food hay bales sometimes you can buy them at the location i personally like to bring what they know from home especially because they can be a little bit nervous and if they you put something new in front of them they won't eat it uh, you want to make sure that they keep eating. Um, depending on how many horses you bring, some bags of pellets or grain, calculate what you need and bring a little bit extra. Um, you can pre-pack, of course, that's what we did a couple of times. You just pre-pack and um, someone can feed for you, for instance. You put the name of the horse or the number of the stall on it and somebody can feed it for you. And it's easy when you have people helping you, um, you don't have to tell them each time how much each horse gets. So if you prepack uh, for morning food or evening late, then it's uh, easier for other people to food for, feed for you. And then of course, a metal ki medical kit for horse and human. Um, bring um, what, I always like to bring is um, not the most kind thing, but a nose twitch, um, just in case something panicky happens to you, to the horse and you need to put it on like um, it, it rolls and it gets its foot stuck in between the bars of your stable or 
uh, you know, the metal bars or whatever, or it panics in a way or in your trailer and um, in the medical kit. Well, you can get them uh, ready. Of course, it's a, a medical kit for a human for sure. And for horses, I don't know exactly what is in it, but it's for us, a veterinarian is always really close. Um, there has to be a veterinarian available for the event. I don't know how that is in the US. I know that you can call one, but I don't know how close they are. I know at Arkering, they are across the road. So that's just one call and they're there within a minute. Um, but that's because the Netherlands is so small. <laughs> Everything is packed on top of each other. So that's the list that I usually, that we usually uh, use in Northern America to go to occurring. And of course, a lot of the stuff that um, I use over here in the Netherlands too, if I go to occurring. Any questions about this? More questions? Yes. Uh, do you use the baby oil or another product on their face to brighten around their eyes and muzzle? I use the baby oil from ears to tail from nose to ears, from ears to tail. I use it everywhere. I just put a little bit extra on the eyes and the nose. So I literally use it everywhere on the horse. And this next uh, question, I, I believe we, uh, we covered that in the first session. Uh, what was that back in February or March? <laughs> But uh, if you may want to, you might want to touch on it just a little bit is can you share with us what type of bridles are acceptable, as well as bits and the lead ropes that the runners prefer when handling the horses. Yeah, that will come up in the next one as well, but I will uh, go into it now as well. Um, the white bridles, of course, the you can use your dressage bridle if you want to, if you know that your horse is difficult in the mouth. Um, the runners prefer the chain. It is because um, I talked about that last time as well. They sometimes need it to refocus the horse just uh, uh, to give them a, uh, a yank on it because they don't know what happens and they're going like oh where where am i and i want to turn and that's what i touched on last time that the horses don't want to stand still and they just turn and turn and so they like the chains it doesn't mean that they use the chain while running because they usually grab the chain in the middle right behind the chin so the chain isn't even touching the chin of the horse but when necessary, they can release and give a jolt just to make sure that the horse doesn't run over them or takes off or uh, anything like that. They really, really, really don't like the leather straps. Or just ropes that go through the bit because if the horse um, doesn't know what it needs to do and it starts running, the runners can't hold the horse. So the leather straps with a little chain on it, they really don't like them. It's really hard to correct the horse. Uh, it really strips the skin off their hands. And if they have to do 20 horses that day, they're not happy with that. You have the there's a name for the fabric. It's, it's a thicker um, mesh rope webbing. The, we have lunge lines that are made of that material too. So not the flat one that with a rubber um, thing on it. But it's just important. I will find the English name for the for 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 it the next time they're chains with soft uh, grip um, web band they call it in Dutch web band um, I will try to find the English word for it um, the bits uh, normal bits so 
the normal right European writing bits, uh, 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 normal snaffles. Then you have the beautiful ones with the horseshoe prints on the side, and they're like a straight bar. Only use them when your horse is used to it. A lot of the times we see horses come up to the curing that never had that bit in, and it's a brand new bridle coming out of the plastic. The bit is still, still needs to be unpacked. And then you know that the horse will go like blah, 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 open mouth, tongue out. Uh, it doesn't correctly fit. So make sure that all that fits before you go to the curing. Make sure that you have it fit at home. And make sure that you have some extra holes because we know that a lot of the times a person comes up to the arena, hands over the horse and the runners hold the horse. And the first thing they do is pull up the bit because as soon as they put a little pressure on the bit, the horse puts the tongue over it. And when the horse puts the tongue over the bit, it doesn't present at all anymore. Not under saddle, not in hand, nothing. So when you fit the bit and the bridle, make sure you have extra holes just in case the runner says, okay, this isn't gonna work when I'm running. And sometimes they walk one lap and they just tell the ju judges, okay, uh, stop for a second. We have to pull up the bit because this isn't gonna work for this horse right now. So it is possible that you see runners do that every now and then. So just make sure that they have the possibility to do that. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. I have to find my cursor again, there it goes. Now on your horse, preparation for your horse, um, put your ideas about training of your horse on paper, um, the goals you have, um, this will make it more real and it is easier to keep yourself to it. So have a training schedule in your head of, it works, but when you put it on paper, it looks more like a plan and it's easier to stick to it. And you can go a week back and say to yourself, okay, this and this didn't work. I have to change something about that schedule. Again, this is something I talked about in an earlier webinar. Find out how the recuperation of your horse is and use this to work out a training rhythm or schedule uh, that works for your horse. I really want to uh, remember you guys on this again. Uh, this is the level where you start at. When you train, you do like a breakdown of the muscles. The body tells itself, I need to recuperate and to prevent to have a big breakdown or a muscle breakdown like this, I have to overcompensate and uh, recuperate a little bit better than I was before. Now, when he was a little bit better than before, you pick up the training again and it, you break down, the horse breaks down muscles again and it will build up again. As you can see on the next one, um, when you break down, it builds up. Then when they're at the top, you do another training and it goes back up again and it repeats itself. So find out how long your horse takes to, to recover, uh, day one training, breaking down muscles, day two recovering, um, it's recovering more and more, about day three, day four, completely recovered, and you can do another training, and you keep going and going and going. So some horses recover faster, some horses recover slow, you do a light workout here and a more heavy workout here. So try to figure that out with your horse. Are you doing um, too quickly after each other, back to back, then you'd only do muscle breakdown and that makes can make your horse or very anxious and hot and very agitated or the Frisian shuts down, protects itself and gets qualified as a lazy Frisian. So remember that that can happen too. Okay, going to the next one. This is what I usually do. Um, plan a schedule for your horse. Remember you're building up to a point of presentation. Now, if you have a balanced training all year door, 
uh, all year through, then uh, you can tweak and change some little uh, um, things on your schedule. Find out what works best for your horse and play with it a little bit. So what I did here, I have four horses. Um, I make my own, um, well, the L is for lunging, W for walk, H for hot walker, B pedal, clipping, rest, under saddle, all that stuff. This is how I build up my training schedule. I have one every week. I um, try to figure out, okay, this horse was very, worked very well on this schedule and I put on a schedule or um, change it or tweak it after each training I did. If I end up having a really good training and the horse sweats and was really working hard and um, it was a really good workout, it can be that I uh, give him a, uh, just a walk and paddock the day after and then the day after lunging or riding. So depending on how the horse is, I have a standard schedule, but if it changes a little bit, so never think that a set schedule is sacred. If, you, if your feeling tells you to change something, try it. You still have a lot of time for the curing. So if you start with this now, if you have the opportunity, you can play with it, tweak with it. Um, you can find out uh, how does my horse do with one day rest or two days rest and test your horse on a Saturday or a Sunday, throw it out or do kind of like a, a show trot with the horse uh, on your lunging line in your arena and try to figure out uh, what your horse, how your horse presents itself. Uh, in the best way. Any questions about the training schedule? Okay, new shoes. This is just something for um, uh, the new Frisian owners or new curing participants. Uh, put the new shoes on about between two to four weeks before the curing, uh, all depending on, on how your horse keeps its feet and how fast they grow. I usually keep about three weeks. Um, now, because the energy of the work goes up as well, I do more pole work and more expressive trot and more energy in the horse. What I like to do is I have them wear bell boots in the training um, all the time because I don't want them to pull off a shoe uh, in the last three weeks. You don't want to have them pull it off and have some piece of the hoof break off or anything. So I always like to use a big bell boots, a little bit bigger than you would do with jumping horses, just to make sure that they don't step on their own shoes and pull them off. Um, so we have to work with um, um, the holes, the screws in the, in the, in the shoes. Um, but that's usually for dressage shows or jumping shows. When a horse is well balanced, you don't need them for the curring um, when you uh, trot them on the grass. So when you have sometimes when you have horses that are not that balanced or need some help, you just put them on so they don't slide because as soon as a horse slips and slides, they don't trust themselves anymore. And um, they don't want to trot that spectacular anymore. It keeps them back. So a balanced horse makes a good trotting horse also on grass. Okay, next one, clipping. I talked about that in my first uh, webinar, but I want to bring it back up again. Um, practice the clipping on your horse way ahead of the curry. Hair can grow back. After a couple of times, you will know how and how long before the curing you uh, should clip your horse. Um, it, very important to know, um, I talked about it before, if you clip the fa face of your horse and it turns out to be a little bit brown, um, you know, all those things you can practice because it, the curing is in September and you can make a lot of mistakes and from mistakes you learn and you get better from making mistakes. So. Clip them every two weeks or every three weeks up until the curing and test things out. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. So um, important to practice with that. 
Um, any questions about this one? Okay, washing. Um, a tip, because we had this happen once, do not use new shampoos or sprays for the first time right before the curing, just to make sure that there won't be any allergic reactions. We had to leave a horse at home because uh, I used a different shampoo, didn't thought about it at all. I used a new shampoo from another brand and uh, the horse ended up with bumps the next morning and it looked awful. So I had to leave it at home. For us, it's not a big deal. You get a veterinarian um, Paperwork tell that your horse is not fit. It was not fit because it was, you could see it on a picture. It was bumps everywhere. Um, and you can sign it up for occurring a week later, two weeks later, a month later, whenever the opportunity is there. You don't have that opportunity. Now, sometimes there is, are currings close together that you are able to drive up to, but it would be a shame to uh, have this happen to you before occurring that you really look forward to going to. So make sure that you try some shampoos and sprays and all that. We didn't know what it was, the spray or the shampoo. I just didn't, it was just one horse. It never happened again, but I always wanna try and remind people that uh, think of it when you go to a curing, especially when you only have one opportunity in a whole year and you're in a complete different country uh, than where all the currings are held at. So very, very important. Now, what I do up to the curing, I uh, bathe them more often. I make sure that after every training, they're really, really clean. Uh, it helps with shedding. Um, I don't put them out during the day anymore. Um, when I do put them out, I put them on a sheet, under a sheet, or in the past, when I had my inside arena, I just turned them out in the inside arena, just to make sure that they didn't turn a color under the sun. So um, keep them in the stable, under a blanket outside, just for a little maximum of two hours, one or two hours take them back in or do it in the evening or early morning, but make sure that they don't change color. Um, the washing helps with keeping them clean, keeping the color, uh, keeping the black color because you rinse out the sweat that makes the color of the coat change too. And it helps you for the big um, wash right before the curing because it isn't that hard to get your horse clean that day. So I really like to have them squeaky clean so when I rub the skin, it's really making the noise squeaky. Um, and it helps when you're in some, um, a lot of the times after a training. Ready for transport. Now this is already almost the end of the webinar. Ready for transport. I like to use bell boots for uh, transport. I don't like the really big puffy um, protectors you put on them, especially on a freeze and it gets warm and sweaty and itchy underneath and with the, on, with the feathers. So I only use bell boots. It protects the coronary band. It keeps the shoes on. It doesn't collect poop in the protectors on the hind legs. Um, I just like to use bell boots and until now that worked perfectly. Also when we travel to other countries, France or um, Denmark or Germany, I just put bell boots on, on horses that I knew that weren't that calm in the trailer or all the horses uh, depending on how they uh, acted. Now you have them clean and washed. So I always like to use a, a thin summer blanket for travel. In the winter, we have a lot of shows in the winter too. You just put uh, uh, two uh, coolers on. Uh, when you know your horse sweats a lot, I always put a really thin fleece cooler on because that draws out the moisture of the coat and it will end up on top of the um, cooler and that will keep your horse nice and clean as well. Um, 
no try to uh, have your horse uh, already uh, practiced with transport a little bit it's hard if you only go to the curing um, to make a long haul just for the curing and it's the first time your horse gets on the trailer so please practice with it a little bit have your horse uh, not be overly tired because it didn't know how to trailer or uh, how to travel or doesn't have a lot of experience with uh, traveling. What we do sometimes if we have a horse that travels or didn't travel that much, we just load them up and take them for a little lap of uh, a mile or two miles and we unload them again, just to make sure that it's not a strange thing for them to do because the whole experience of the curring is all new. And uh, this is something that you can practice and exercise at home. Um, so for me, it would be nice or for you guys that to know that your horse travels uh, more relaxed. Any questions about this? Nope. Okay. Nope, no questions at this point. Um, I've got a few other things I'll, I'll add when you're done with your presentation. Yes, I'm already almost at the end. So I uh, already wanna know what I had up for next month. That is practice uh, walking full for the curry and presenting your horse for the curry. So that will be uh, the last preparation. Uh, we did the lunging, we did the practice in the walk, but what I wanna show you is um, how you can practice the curing trot when you don't have a runner at home. But when you do have uh, an inside or outside arena, there's a way for you to practice uh, the extended trot without you having to hold the horse. It's always nice uh, to have the horse uh, practice that extension a couple of times. So that's what I want to show. Um, what I really want to um, show you guys is what you can do um, to get your horse as ready as possible for the curing. I can show you, well, you have to have a good runner and this and that all has to be perfect. I know not everybody have that has that opportunity. So I'm going to show you a way that when I didn't have a runner, a way how I trained the horse just to make sure that I knew that the horse could do that extension and understood what was going on when he heard the rattle, the shaker box and the whip. So that's something um, you can practice at home uh, too. So that is for next month. And then of course, after you've done all that, you hope you end up with a shining horse like this. I showed this before. This is the horse I started with. And um, this is the horse I ended up with. Um, uh, uh, the, normally we have about four to six weeks to prepare a horse over here. That's quite normal. Um, it, rarely happens that you have them longer than six weeks, sometimes eight weeks. It's different in uh, Northern America because you have to figure it out by yourself how to get your horse ready. So uh, the reason to do these webinars now is to give you the opportunity to play with it, to prepare your horse uh, for the curing and to figure out uh, how to have you your horse look good for the curing in a way that the judges want to see them. Um, that's about what I wanted to tell you tonight. So I swapped it around. This would normally be the last presentation and I would add some extra things, but I will do that next time um, because then the weather is better and <laughs> I don't have to be up into my ankles in the mud to uh, show you what how we uh, walk and practice with the foals because they're out in the fields uh, during the day and it's really, really wet right here now, right now. So. so I do have a question here. I, yes. I, um, 
I believe we may have answered this in a previous webinar, and I'd like to again encourage everybody to go back and uh, watch the whole series from the beginning. Uh, but do you clip your horses every week, and how short do you clip them? Um, where? I mean, um, like the mares we have in the stable right now, they all had their foals, and like a week before they were foaling, I all clipped them, did the legs and all that stuff, but they weren't clipped the whole winter. Um, a horse that I train, I try to clip every two weeks just to clip it nice and clean. And then every month uh, or every six week, I do a really clean cut. I take all the hair off on the shortest um, uh, uh, measurement of the clippers. The face, I always do it really short. Uh, the ears is when you go back to the first webinar and back to to go real quick. Oh, there it was. To this picture, this is how we clip the ears. I showed in the first webinar that uh, you're not allowed to clip any more than this. Um, but as soon as you put oil in this, you don't see any hairs anymore. Um, we now, by law, are not allowed to take off any whiskers or uh, hairs of the eyes, um, also by the uh, worldwide uh, FAE. You're not allowed to do that on international shows anymore. The free KFPS doesn't like you to cut these nostrils off either. I do clean it up a little bit, make them a little bit shorter and just have them around the nose and the lips and the other ones, I do take them off a little bit just to make it a little bit cleaner. Underneath the head, I do them every two weeks. The ones, I, the horses I train, I just clean clip as short as possible around the face. So um, uh, the chin, so the jawline. And the legs, um, I have one horse that doesn't uh, have a saddle presentation in three weeks. I know her color changes a little bit when I clip it. So I clipped it last week. And in two weeks, she has a little presentation. Then the black hair came, comes through and I just have to tighten it up a little bit and it will be nice and uh, black and nice and clean. I just keep clipping whenever I have a clipper in my hands already and the horse is kind of clean. I don't like to clip them when they're sandy or muddy. Um, so I always make sure that I rinse them really well the day before or wash the legs the day before I do the clipping. So that's important to keep your razor blades really sharp. Yes, so, any other questions? Um, don't have any other questions at the moment. A uh, couple of things I just wanted to uh, point out real quick as you're putting together your checklist and, and so forth is to remember the dates. Uh, yes. We do have requirements on when when your paperwork is due to us. Yes. Uh, so to avoid those pesky late fees uh, for this year, your entry has to be in by August 6th um, to avoid the first assessment of late fees. And then the, uh, the, the last date is August 20th. So try to get your entries in by, by those dates um, to avoid any late fees. Um, August 6th is the one you really want to circle. Um, also, uh, when it comes to fees, uh, make sure you reach out to your site host because there are extra fees uh, for stabling and so forth that uh, are not available, are not known to Fauna. So, uh, uh, make sure you check with your site host just so you have those fees and, and everything is uh, uh, taken care of. Um, those were the, the two keys things that I wanted to mention. Uh, there are two ways to enter your horse. You can enter your horse either through the uh, Fauna portal uh, by logging in and selecting your horse, or you can mail in the hard copy form. Uh, either way is, is just fine. Um, just, uh, just two, two ways to get it, get it entered. Uh, IBOPs and uh, regular entries are available through the portal. Um, that is live. And um, 
so go ahead and uh, we've got we've got probably you know this is the first time uh, in 10 years we've got uh, close to 40 horses entered at this point in the game wow. and the inspections aren't aren't for another you know 100 120 days so um, I'm quite impressed people are, are, are very eager to get their horses entered I and can one other imagine. point what's that I can imagine after yeah. you after a year, no shows or no curing at all. Um, and one other point I'd like to make is that if you have a yearling mare or colt that you were that uh, due to COVID were not able to bring uh, to the inspection last year, that there is no fee to bring them uh, this year. So please get them entered. Uh, the only caveat to that is they had to have been registered in 2020. Uh, so please uh, get your horses registered. Um, if you have any questions about registering them or the inspections, uh, give us a call. A lot of the information, checklists, and things that uh, uh, Petra brought in today are on our website as far as the uh, uh, inspection handbook, site host handbook. All that information is available to you so that you can uh, create your own checklist for what you need. So, um, Petra, I don't have any other questions or comments. Um, People are, are thanking you uh, for a job well done and very informative information. Um, I think we look forward to the next one, which I have scheduled for June 24th. Yes. Is that, is that what you have down? And that'll be our, our, our final one of these, these five. Yes, um, and, and please, if people have some extra questions or um, things that they wanna know from me or about the horses or, please have them send it to you so you can send it to me and um, I mm -hmm. can maybe answer them um, at the end or at the beginning of the um, webinar if it's about the previous webinars um, or I can work them into the webinars, in, into the last webinar uh, if I have that opportunity with what I have set up already. Perfect, perfect. Um couple of things. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention, though, uh, uh, the Fauna Board of Directors just recently approved of two motions that do affect everybody and their inspections. Um, they, uh, we are now starting to uh, uh, do knock hearings here, uh, which we're going to call post inspections. Um, do you have a, can you maybe get, elaborate on what a knock hearing is for everybody? Um, and not cutting, that is when the horse is sick or not able to go to the current. So what I talked about in the beginning that we have that opportunity throughout the year um, that you can show your horse at that moment. So, right. um, so you have a not cutting. Um, when your horse wasn't able to be shown at the curring or there was something wrong with your horse at the curring or you weren't able to come because of a flat tire or a car breakdown right. on your way there. So something like right. that, yes. So yes, uh, so your horse can be seen at a different inspection if you were signed up in Wisconsin, can't yes. make it, still have the opportunity to go to one of the other inspection sites, uh, that opportunity is there. You just need to contact us right away so that we can get that paperwork taken care of and get your horse switched. Yes. Um, the other one is a hair curing, which in North America we're going to call reinspections. Yes. Um, well, that's that's the right word. So these these uh, interestingly, so if you do not like the results that you had at your at your inspection, you think it could have have gotten a second premium or a star. And Petra, please, please, uh, if I'm saying anything out of line, please tell me. But um, you, you could appeal the results and yes. bring it to a hair curing yes. uh, or a reinspection. Now, we're, we in North America are only going to offer these at our mare shows because uh, we're very limited geographically. And so we want to make sure that everybody has the same opportunity. And, uh, and that's still a challenge with the geographical uh, challenges that we have, but yes. we do have a, a mare show on the west and a mare show on the east, and so we are offering these uh, reinspections at those events uh, 
Again, if you don't like your results, you need to contact the FAUNA office immediately so that we can get this uh, entered in and, and taken care of for you properly. Um, I want to add something to that. Yes, please do. A reinspection doesn't mean that the uh, evaluation the horse had last time will be upgraded or stays the same. Correct. The other judges can take away what you got awarded to your horse. So if your horse got star second preemie and you really convinced that it's a star first preemie and you go to a re-evaluation, a re-judging, and that judge thinks, or oh, your horse doesn't present as well as it could, so it's not up to the judge. The judge will judge what they see. If your horse doesn't present as well as it did when it got a second preemie, they can take that second preemie away and your horse becomes stud book third preemie. So really, really, really think about doing a re-judging because it's not only about upgrading. If your horse has a bad day and you know because he had a bad day, he only got a third preemie. And always, and I really want to um, say this, after the judging, at the curring, you can always go up to the judge and ask why the horse got judged the way it got judged. So I know in the past, some Frisian horse clubs didn't allow horse owners to go up to a judge and talk to them. I asked the judges why that was. The judges never knew that that happened. Always, if you want to have information about your horse, you're always welcome to go up to the judge after the inspection and ask them if they can explain better why your horse didn't get uh, a, a degree or a star um, where you did expect to get it. Um, sometimes the language barrier is a thing. Then ask somebody who can translate really well, uh, a person like me that knows Dutch really well, that can translate to uh, the owner uh, what the judge exactly means by some things. Mm -hmm. So we will always be there to help out if necessary when we're there. Uh, but you are always welcome to go up to a judge and ask them after the curing what they wrote down about your horse. They can look it up in their little books and they will say, okay, well, this and this and this and this was the reason. So they can uh, take their time, explain it to you. Um, sometimes it's something um, of the exterior that is not able to change, that you can't change, that they say, okay, well, this and this is the major problem that it didn't become star. Of course, you can go next year and the other judge has a little bit of a different opinion about it, or they just didn't saw what the judge saw last year. It is still is literally judging uh, the horse. They're not computers. Not everybody sees them through the same eyes. Not everybody has the same way the brain works. So sometimes if your horse excels in the trot the year after, it will compensate for a little, um, um, a little spongy is what they say, a little spongy leg there or a not as a beautiful, hoof or you know so there's a balance in for that so um always go up to the judge if you want to know uh, why and what and how so don't be afraid of go going up to the judge really important can, to know i think it can certainly be in, intimidating that's for sure yes uh to talk to them and and so forth but don't don't be they're they're no. they're no different than you i and, and everyone exactly. else and they love to talk to people Exactly. And they'll they'll talk for an hour about your specific horse and what they saw. Exactly. What they saw. So yes. Um, had a couple questions come in real quick, Petra. Uh, we'll get these answered before we uh, uh, we end for the evening. 
Uh, would you bring a foal to the curing if it had a tiny white mark on its forehead? It is small enough and allowed, but would you would you do it knowing the expense of the judging? Uh, well, your judging is probably more expensive than ours. Mm -hmm. If you're um, sure that it has a nice conformation and a nice walk and trot, then and you just like the experience, that's important too. It's an emotional thing you go through. It's um, um, it's the experience that's very important too. It's all about emotion. So if you like to do the event um, and show your uh, your uh, full and it has a little white spot on the face and it is allowed, then you can still get a first preemie or a second preemie or explanation about um, how or what. I know the judges have a little coin now. All the judges have the same coin and they measure it and then you know for sure. And I know the horse grows, but the white spot doesn't. Remember that. So um, I think when you have a good foal, I would bring it, but I am not uh, the person who knows your uh, wallet. So um, it's an expression in Dutch. I don't know how deep your wallet is. So it's up to you if you think it's not worth it. Sometimes it's a good way to get nice pictures and a little video to sell it later. Um, it's all up to what you like to have as an experience uh, on the curing. Okay, well, Petra, that does take care of, uh, let's see. So this question goes back to uh, linear score sheets. And if they're uh, given their linear score sheet when they're three, and it cannot be changed after they, after it's been done the first time, will right. the judges share with you any improvements to help with future breeding plans? Example, poor walk, that isn't, can that be improved? Well, you have all those, uh, that information you can find on, uh, I think it's on FANA to now too, it's all translated that you can, if you have your score sheet, uh, you can get all the score sheets of the stallions, what they improve, and you just put it next to each other and you go from there. So it's all digital available. Um, I would go to that particular uh, um, uh, right. information. Uh, it's also you, something our, our breeding committee can also help uh, with those and answer those questions for you uh, by looking at your breeding, uh, your linear score sheet and helping you select the right stallion and giving you the information. So uh, that's another tool to, to use as well. Yeah. And be critical yourself on how your horse was as a three-year-old, but if your horse wasn't judged as a three-year-old, but for the first time as a five-year-old, that score sheet looks a lot different than it would as a three-year-old. Remember that. So um, your horse develops, and uh, if you had a very youthful and a poorly muscled horse when it was three, and it is a complete different horse than it was five or the other way around, you have a different horse that you look at uh, than what the score sheet said. So they judge what they see and your horse will change over time. That's important to, to know. Well, Petra, I think that's gonna wrap it up for this evening. I know it's getting uh, late over there for you. Um, you know, we, we can't thank you enough for, for doing these. I've got the next one scheduled for June 24. Yes. Uh, that's again, Thursday, this is the last Thursday of the month. Um, this was recorded, will be posted on our YouTube station, uh, right there on the uh, Fauna homepage. Uh, you can access that YouTube station. Again, we can't, we couldn't have done these uh, webinars without the uh, support and sponsorship of the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses. Uh, so Petra, thank you again. Uh, hopefully it'll dry out over there for you here real soon. And you'll be able to get out into the fields. Yes. Um, and we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in a month. Okay, thank you. And thank okay. everybody for being here again tonight. And you enjoy the beautiful weather there, Jason. And um, see you next month. Okay, thanks, Petra. Take care. 
Thank you.